the image didn't shock the world. He hadn't made his rubber quota for the day. Photographer Alice Seeley recorded in 1904. So the Belgian appointed overseers had cut off his daughter's hand and foot. Her name was Boali. She was five years old. Then they killed her. But they weren't finished. Then they killed his wife too. And because that didn't seem quite cruel enough, quite strong enough to make their case, they cannibalized both. And they presented Nsala with the tokens, the leftovers from the once living body of his darling child. In the past months, tens of thousands of refugees have been fleeing attacks by the M23 insurgent group in the Democratic Republic of Congo's North Kivu province. The insurgents are reported to have unleashed large-scale terror, just as the Belgian colonialists did, including extrajudicial executions, rape, and even forcing victims to cook and consume human flesh. East African peacekeepers have now been deployed in the region to end the violence. But it's far from clear if they'll succeed. And even if they do succeed, for how long? A century ago, Congo's great rubber plantations fueled the savagery of colonial Belgium. Today, the DRC's enormous riches, a third of the world's cobalt, which powers everything from mobile phone to car batteries, giant reserves of Colombo tantalite for electronic circuit boards, tin, lithium, gold, diamonds, these blessings are remain a curse. The conflict in the DRC doesn't get even a passing mention in Indian newspapers. As we seek to grow our industrial base and secure supply chains, however, it's imperative for Delhi to begin paying attention or risk the unhappy outcome of countries like China running away with our future. Foreign mining companies have long been known to be increasingly protecting their investments by shipping in mercenaries. Last year, outrage erupted after a video surfaced of mercenaries working for a Chinese company whipping local residents who had allegedly trespassed in search of copper. That ought to be a problem for the rest of the world and not just because of concern for human rights. Like so many wars across the world, The crisis in the DRC is in part fueled by regional powers. Insurgent groups like M23 control informal trafficking chains that move mineral resources from the DRC into neighbouring countries like Uganda and Rwanda. In essence, insurgents act as proxy armies of their neighbours. Earlier this year, the International Court of Justice ordered Uganda to pay damages of $325 million to the DRC for waging a proxy war between 1998 and 2003, driven by the looting of gold, diamonds and timber. The DRC's neighbours, of course, deny accusations of theft. But the data tells a different story. 40% of Uganda's exports now consist of gold, even though the country's own central bank estimates just a tenth of over $1.7 billion it exports is actually mined within the country. The obvious implication is that it's coming illegally from next-door DRC. Even though Rwanda, similarly, isn't a major producer of Colombo tantalite, it is mysteriously the third largest exporter. The immediate trigger for the M23 campaign, expert Jason Stearns has suggested, was strategic, led by efforts to stop this smuggling. The DRC and Uganda arrived at an agreement to build roads, one running from Kasindi to Beni and Butembo, and another from Bunagana to Goma, which were to be built with protection from Uganda's military. That would have integrated the DRC with its eastern neighbours. The road would also allow for more regulation and taxation of illegal cross-border mineral traffic. In Rwanda, the Ugandan troop deployments to build this road were seen as a potential strategic threat. In a speech to parliament in February, President Paul Kagame warned of retaliation. 
we must do what we must do, he said, with or without the consent of others. Foreign intervention isn't the only reason though for the warfare we're seeing. Insurgent armies like M23, scholars Kasper Hoffman and Christoph Vogel note, have cashed in on the welter of unresolved ethnic conflicts which have been raging on since the colonial period. In the regime of dictator Mobutu Sese Seko, who was deposed in 1996, ethnic fires were stoked, stripping the Banya Mulenge, that is Congolese of Rwandan extraction, of their citizenship. Largely led by ethnic Tutsi, M23 commanders fought alongside the Rwandan Patriotic Front, which overthrew the genocidal Hutu regime in Rwanda many years ago. They brought the skills they learnt back to their country to fight against a regime that was marginalising them. Large numbers of similar insurgencies dot the region, driven by complex ethnic conflicts. The Islamic State-affiliated Allied Democratic Front of Uganda evolved from the Rwenzururu ethnic nationalist movement of Bakonzo in Uganda and the Nande in the DRC. It has now conducted large-scale massacres. For months, Ugandan forces have been attacking the ADF inside the DRC, but with no military success. There are also multiple insurgencies active in the northeast of the DRC and proxy wars are raging in the highlands of Fiji adjoining Burundi. Fighting with insurgents has also led other countries into fighting within the DRC. Earlier this year, Burundi troops and irregulars were reported to have crossed the border into Rwanda, where they allied with various tribes to fight the R.E.D. Tabara insurgent group. R.E.D. Tabara, in turn, allied with another Burundi insurgent group, the FNL, to defend it. Exactly how the M23 story will end is unclear, because you see the curtain was supposed to have fallen on it a decade ago. In operations that ran from March to November 2013, the M23 was crushed by the United Nations Organization's Stabilization Mission and the Force Intervention Brigade, which was sent by Tanzania, Malawi and South Africa. The M23's leader, known locally as the Terminator, was handed over to the International Criminal Court to face war crimes charges and the remnants of the group surrendered to Uganda. But here it is, back again, and killing. The lesson from the rebirth of M23 is that insurgencies will keep on being reborn unless the global community can put in place an effective security architecture. Large parts of the world's most valuable resources, from hydrocarbons to minerals, are to be found in countries mired in ethnic or religious conflicts. Leaving security to mercenaries opens the path to proxy wars and colonial era savagery. Like other democratic countries with an economic stake in the region though, India has mostly remained on the sidelines. The United Nations traditional peacekeeping system just doesn't have the resources and institutional framework to engage in the long-term nation-building operations that are really needed. The price for that failure the war in the DRC shows might end up being much higher than the world ought to be willing to pay. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm National Security Editor of The Print.